Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Mr. Kunst asked me to do a quick presentation about my thesis topic, which is the improvement of real flavor stability by the removal of transition metals during measurement. And for, for those who don't know me yet, I am Thierry Mertens. I am originally from Belgium, but I've been living here in Berlin for three and a half years now in order to do this uh, European Joint Doctorate of Food Science project, which is funded by the European Union, as you can see. And this project was in collaboration with here the Technical University of Berlin and the University of Kaiserlöwen in Belgium. So uh, for those who don't know the uh, issue of beer sta uh, flavor stability, I will give a brief introduction to this question. So I think I speak for us all when I say that we all like beer. But beer has one major flaw. It is an inherently unstable product. And this can uh, give problems in terms of freshness and off flavors. And this year is a photo I took in a bottle shop uh, not so far away from here. And as you can already see, uh, some dust started collecting here on the bottles. And this, unfortunately, is not an uncommon thing to see, especially not in big retailers that sell uh, a high variety of beers. This is another photo I took in the same shop, but here I did some reorganizing of the bottles. So left, you can see bottles without dust, and right, you can see bottles with dust. And I looked at the bottling dates, and these two beers differ five months from each other. Now, if I tell you that under these conditions, especially of a room temperature, already three months from bottling, a beer can start getting stale and start developing off flavors. So I think it's quite clear that the industry does have an issue here. And it's not me trying to point a finger at uh, the retailers, because, of course, uh, trying to store all this beer cold is very expensive and difficult. But it's me telling uh, that it's up to us as scientists to try and find a creative solution for this problem. If you can somehow uh, do something to the process and prolong beer shelf life, a lot less uh, stale beer would be on the market, a lot less stale beer would be drunk. I think that's something you can all get behind. So that brings me back to my topic, improving of beer flavor stability by removal of transition metals. Uh, normally this presentation is a bit longer than 15 minutes, so I will, there will be certain slides that I will go a bit quicker over. But uh, I will go over the theory, uh, explaining what the role is of these transition metals, and what the issue is, and how we can try to fix it in order uh, through chelation. And then I will discuss um, some main uh, research findings that I did over these past three years. Um, I did three major studies. The first study was the screening of a variety of chelators, but in buffer solutions that mimic work and beer, so clean matrices. Then I took out of those bunch of chelators the most uh, five interesting ones, and I tested them in work during meshing, which is of course a way more complex environment in terms of matrix and uh, heat. And I also tested if I could uh, potentially optimize the chelation capacities of the chelators. And in the final study, the third study, I took the best performing chelators out of the two studies and employed them during brewing uh, from start to finish and uh, looked whether they would actually improve uh, beer flavor stability in the long run. <coughs> so, transition metals, what is the problem, where do they come from? And I can start by saying that uh, there is no way to avoid uh, metals leaching out in the beer. They can come from exogenous sources, which is the brewing equipment, the kettle, the, the mill, or they can come from endogenous sources, which is our brewing ingredients, the water, the yeast, the hops, and the grains. And especially the grains are actually a huge source for the, uh, the metals that end up in the beer. Of course, there are also beneficial uh, metals, such as calcium and zinc. But the problem uh, lies with uh, the transition metals that you see here, iron, 
copper and manganese. And why is that? Well, it's actually um, that these metals are able to uh, catalyze these radical generating uh, reactions that you can see here. And these reactions are capable of forming some sort of cycles. We call this uh, the Fenton and Haber reaction mechanism. So what it does is that this mechanism is capable of uh, converting our fairly inactive molecular oxygen, as we can find it in the beer and in the packaging, to these fairly reactive oxygen species. And like the name suggests, these reactive oxygen species are so reactive that they destroy our precious beer compounds uh, or hop aromas, nice crisp, fresh flavor, and in the process, uh, the destroyed compounds form off flavors, which are always or almost always uh, perceived as unpleasant. Uh, and as you can see, uh, this this mechanism is um, catalyzed by the metal ions, which are indicated by the letter M here. And this is a graphical uh, presentation of how a beer might develop over time. So over time, a beer might uh, taste more like caramel, sweet, cherry, or cardboard. And these are uh, not very liked by the consumer. So in summary, uh, oxidation, of which a lot of this metal, uh, transition metal is written, can turn a nice fresh product into a stale, unpleasant product. So, uh, of course, we don't want it, that. Um, if we could somehow remove iron, copper, manganese from the process, we could potentially prolong the freshness rate. That brings us to the thesis hypothesis, which was, uh, can we remove these metals by chelation? And the idea of chelation is very simple, so we have our metals that we want to minimize. In theory, there should exist uh, an ideal chelator that is capable of forming a complex with, this, uh, with these metal ions. And if this metallic chelate is big enough so that we can effectively filter or lower it out during the process, then it would minimize uh, these uh, iron, copper, and manganese ions uh, during brewing. And this could uh, block or at least slow down the reactions you see and greatly uh, benefit beer flavor stability. So that was the theory. Here uh, is a busy slide, but I already talked about it. It's the three uh, research studies that I did. So in short, the first one again, screening of chelators in buffer solutions. Second, the chelators in word during meshing. And the third study was the actual brewing itself from start to finish. The first study, screening of chelators in buffer solutions. So the next slide will also be a bit busy, but the most important thing, so here you can see the schematic of the methodology, but as I said, the most important thing is in the right corner, which are the nine chelators that I studied, EDTA, EDTA citric acid, tartaric acid, quercetin, chlorogenic acid, acrylic acid, gallic acid, phytic acid, and our beloved phytic acid, and under this list, you can find the metal species which I tested them on, which are the transition metals in bold, iron, copper, and manganese, and zinc and calcium and magnesium, which are our beneficial metals that we don't want to lose during the process. Mm -hmm. So I made combinations of chelators and metals. I mixed them. I let them react for uh, 60 minutes in this buffer solutions that mimic wort and beer. And after 60 minutes, I filtrated them with a microfilter. Then I analyzed the leftover filtrate uh, for metal ions. And before I show the, the metal ion data, I would like to show you this picture because it is interesting to see how some of these uh, chelator metal combinations can make very colorful mixtures. And the uh, one metallic acid is actually the one on the right and the left, which are the darkest. So already here you can see that there is interesting science going on. Here are the metal ion data. And to make it less overwhelming, uh, I color-coded it. 
So dark green indicates that uh, very little of the metal remained in the filtrate, meaning that A, complexes were formed, and B, the complexes were big enough so that they could be effect effectively filtered out. And the la last part is uh, an important nuance, because when you look at the column of EDTA, uh, nothing is in dark green, but EDTA for sure is making complexes. This just means that the complex that EDTA is forming is too small or small enough to penetrate the filter. And then we see the last column, the tannic acid, which is in this test our clear winner. Uh, it's taking out almost completely uh, both, met metal spe uh, both iron species and copper, which is ideal. And it does this uh, by far the best at pH of 5.6, which is the pH that we would have during measure. At pH of 4.3, which is the beer pH, it's still doing something, but it's way, way less. And this is uh, a tendency that we saw for all the key agents that they all perform better at the pH of uh, burn, which is the reason why in follow-up studies we decided to employ the chelators only during measure. So other uh, interesting chelators were, uh, as you can see, quercetine, chlorodelic acid, ferulic acid, and gallic acid that would uh, also chelate, especially iron 3, and gallic acid is also chelating a bit of copper. Uh, phytic acid is chelating zinc, which is something we do not want because we want zinc during, during our process. But with phytic acid, we actually saw an interesting phenomenon happening uh, when we combined it with a mix of metal ions, but the data is not shown here. But then it was capable of uh, chelating transition metals also. One thing I would also like to point out is that unfortunately, uh, none of the chelators tested is capable of chelating out manganese. And this is, uh, yeah, manganese is a notoriously hard uh, ion to chelate. This brings me to the second study where I took five of these chelators and I tested them during mesh. EDTA, citric acid, tannic acid, gallic acid, and phytic acid. And these are, uh, this is my meshing schedule. And these are some variables that I interchanged to see if I could play around with the uh, chelation uh, efficiency. So the addition time of chelator, mass pH, temperature of meshing out, and chelator concentration. And I could uh, make a nice model out of all these tests, of which uh, you can see a graph here. This is the behavior of uh, iron with tannic acid. And as you can see on the y axel, we have the tannic acid concentration. And at pH 6, the tannic acid is so uh, effective that even at a very low concentration, it is already chelating out a lot of the iron. And a six-fold uh, increase of concentration uh, does not cause a huge uh, reduction in iron. However, at pH 5, the tannic acid becomes way less uh, effective and we need a higher dose to achieve the same low numbers uh, as we see here. So this is not only due to tannic acid being less effective, but there is also another effect going on, which is the pH effect. So if we acidify the mesh from 6 to 5, we see a big, big uh, increase of iron, but not only iron, it's also the same for manganese and zinc. Um, so this is also an important effect uh, to be aware of. Here is a graph of tannic acid and manganese, and like in the buffer solutions, tannic acid is not able to chelate manganese, but it's a nice way to show Again, the effect of pH on the levels of transition levels. Now, for the other chelators, these were the results also on iron. So citric acid, no reduction. Phytic acid, no reduction. Gallic acid, also no effect. And for EDTA, it was actually the opposite. The more EDTA we added during meshing, the higher uh, the amount of iron we found in the lottery, which actually makes sense because 
the EDTA is extracting iron from the grain and because it's making so small complexes, it's going straight through the span grains and we can pick it up in the water further. Okay, these are interesting results, but it left me a bit at a dead end in my thesis because uh, tannic acid is our superstar and this is actually something that is already known. Uh, it's, it's the reason why a company like Omnichem is using this. Uh, so I had to start uh, getting a bit creative. So I tested uh, 10 polyphenolic food extracts and, and looked how they would influence the metal during mesh. So first, curcuma, cinnamon, raspberry, grapefruit, ginkgo, grapeseed, rice seed. As you see, all of these, uh, also no pistol, <laughs> all of these have almost a zero effect on the uh, metal content in the water first. But then I struck gold, green tea, and especially the pomegranate extract were both capable of producing uh, iron during brewing. Let me add them during meshing. So for the last study, I took the green tea, the pomegranate, and the tannic acid to do tests with. And here's the direct comparison between uh, pomegranate extract and tannic acid. So as you can see, the pomegranate is uh, capable of producing the levels of iron um, even more at the same uh, levels of chelator. It's overheating or what? <laughs> yes, yes. It's, it's, it's okay, so what this graph tells you is basically that uh, pomegranate is more effective at the same uh, PVPs as tannic acid in lowering the iron at meshing, which is a, a very, very good result. And this result actually translate, translates well on the ESR as well. So this is uh, an electron spin uh, resonance spectroscopy that we did on the pitching work. And as you can see, uh, the pomegranate brews, both of them, are the lowest in radical uh, generation, which in theory would give a more uh, oxy oxidative stable beer, with tannic acid being second best. So on to the final study, which is unfortunately due to corona still ongoing at, or delayed. But I can already show you some results. But first, what I did, I made eight brews, one where I did early addition and one where I did late addition of this tannic acid, pomegranate, and green tea. Of course, there's also a, a blank, which nothing was added to. And here we can follow how the, how the iron fluctuates during brewing. So this is the onset of meshing, the end of meshing. Uh, of course, these are very heterogeneous uh, samples because they're still full with grain. And, and, but you can already see here that there is, uh, in general, a reduction in iron because of the hot break going on, uh, coagulation of proteins during the meshing. This is the mesh filtration. Iron is going up again, most likely because it's being uh, washed out during the Lottering. But here is where it gets more interesting. Onset of boiling, end of boiling, and especially the pitching work, where it is very clear that the both uh, the pomegranate uh, brews are the lowest in iron content. Iron content at the uh, finished burn, with the tannic acid being second best, and green tea still doing better than the blanks. And for the final slide, this is a test that Mr. Kunz did, where he added a pure ellagic acid, which is the active compound in the pomegranate extract, uh, to beer, directly to beer, and the line in red is the blank, where no ellagic acid is added. And also here you can see that uh, in any purity and any concentration, ellagic acid is capable of directly lowering the radical generation in beer. So very promising results. Uh, I thank you for your attention, and if there are any slides where I went over a bit too quick, I can return to them 
But this is it for now. Thanks. Thank you.